Well, good evening, everyone. It's so great to see a near full house. My name is Rob Marks. I was former head of the board of the <clears throat> Greenwich Library Trustees. And I say unequivocally that I think tonight you're going to have a real treat. And I say that because I had 20, 25 years of experience on the, IR, on the International Rescue Committee board. And I believe we have the two right speakers to make this the most meaningful and impactful <clears throat> evening for you. Our plan is to have 50 minutes of discussion, although I recently decided maybe it should be 60 minutes of discussion, and 20 minutes of Q&A. Um, if you have a question, raise your hand. A staff member will come to you with a microphone. Um, <clears throat> there will be a video in a couple of days on our YouTube channel, the Greenwich Library YouTube channel. And I implore you to silence your phones if you can, and, and no photos. <clears throat> so before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about our two speakers tonight. First is Madeline Sadler, the Chief Operating Officer of the IRC. Madeline came to the IRC nine years ago, along with her compatriot, David Miliband. Her previous position was a special advisor in the UK's Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and also in the Department of the Environment. <clears throat> when she arrived nine years ago, the IRC was a $450 million organization with 22,000 employees. She has now served as Chief of Staff, Head of Operations and Strategy, and now Chief Operating Officer, where she oversees supply chain, security, HR, IT, external relations, and a few other things. Whereas nine years ago, it was $450 million and 22,000 staff, it is now $1.5 billion in expense and 45,000 in staff. <clears throat> in 43 countries overseas tw and 28 locations throughout the U.S. And happily for us tonight, after not traveling during most of the pandemic, Madeline has recently visited IRC operations in numerous hotspots around the world and has the latest firsthand knowledge of the situations in those countries. Our other, our other conversational partner tonight really needs no introduction. If you aren't familiar with Scott Pelley, then you really haven't been paying attention to the national news for the past 32 years, <laughs> all of which he has spent at CBS. He's been a correspondent at 60 Minutes since 1999, and from 2011 to 2017, he served as the anchor of the CBS Evening News. Starting at the tender age of 15, when he worked, presumably a summer job, at his hometown newspaper, the Lubbock Avalanche Journal, over his career, Scott has won <clears throat> 42 Emmy Awards, four DuPont Columbia Awards, two Peabody Awards, and the Walter Cronkite Award. You must have quite a trophy room at home. <laughs> and finally, Scott has served on the board of the trustees of trustees of the IRC and has also been a co-chair of the IRC overseers and other things as well. <clears throat> so I wanna thank Scott and Madeline for sharing some of their busy schedule tonight, but without further ado, I turn the program over to them. Oh, thank you for being here, ladies and gentlemen. When uh, Rob asked me if I could come speak at the Greenwich Library, I said, well, I, I don't know. And uh, then he said, it's for the IRC. And I said, oh, yep, I'm here. Um, IRC is the most magnificent organization. You don't, you don't know this, but you don't want to live in a world without the IRC. Uh, it was started at the suggestion of Albert Einstein to get... Jews out of occupied, but Nazi occupied Europe. And ever since then, from that day to this, the IRC has been in the middle of every refugee crisis in the world. We are so fortunate to have Madeline Sadler here with us uh, because she knows the operations of the IRC better than just about anyone ever has, I'm sure. Madeline, give us a sense, if you would, of the refugee picture 
globally today. We, we hear a lot, rightfully so, about Ukraine, but paint the global picture for us. Well, it's a, it's a big global picture and a sad global picture. So we, um, I was thinking about this, that nine years ago, as Rob was so eloquently putting it, we as an organization were a $450 million organization. But at that time, there were the UNHCR numbers were around 50 million displaced, forcibly displaced people. So we talk about, we actually work with people who are displaced within their countries um, and refugees who are crossing borders. So we, the terminology is forces, forcibly displaced across um, across different countries. Um, and uh, now this year, the numbers were 100 million. So there are 100 million people um, and that's doubled in the last 10 years. That's 1% of the global population are displaced right now. So that's kind of just the sense of the numbers. And we are experiencing the greatest refugee crisis in Europe since the Second World War. Absolutely. What and is IRC doing there? So it's a big day on the on news um, around Ukraine today. So we were in Ukraine as soon as the war, in fact, before the war actually broke out. So we were starting to set up operations in Poland and Moldova because we knew that there were going to be a number of people coming out. We had no idea that it was going to be 7 million people that were going to be coming out of Ukraine. There's also 6 million people who are displaced within Ukraine. So one of the things that we're really finding is as the war extends and keeps going, um, that the people who are out inside the country are really struggling in that they can't obviously carry on with their jobs. They're really struggling to hold their families together. And so we're doing a lot of cash assistance within the country. As people are coming out of the country, we're also trying to make sure that they are resettled and in schools and with um, health uh, services. So we're doing our resettlement and integration work there. Um, and as the, as the, these incredible um, uh, shifts in the war and Kherson um, coming back to the Ukraine over the last few days, we're already in Kherson. So one of the things that we're doing there is providing cash to people who are without um, anything, but also med mobile medical units so that whilst the government gets themselves back and sorted out and op reopens the hospitals and gets water and electricity to these these people, we're trying to make sure that they are um, getting health care. In the spring, uh, shortly after the Russian invasion, I was in Przemysl, Poland, which is about six miles from the border, and at the train station there. Train after train after train of refugees coming in, about a thousand on each train, standing room only, and all women and children, mm -hmm. because military-aged men were not allowed out of Ukraine. Uh, most people don't realize that the vast majority of refugees in this world are women and children, the vast majority. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And they're the most vulnerable. So when they're on the move, they're also, they've got the most, the biggest protection needs. And so there's two things about that that incredible fact. And I, I honestly feel like I should be interviewing Scott, by the way, because I, <laughs> I think he knows a heck of a lot more about this than I do. So we'll, we'll, we'll flip it at some point soon. Um, but women and girls are, um, are two things. One is they are more vulnerable and we need to make sure that, and that we give them the kind of protection services that we give them and we are very well known for as IRC. The other thing is they unlock the future of their children and often they unlock um opportunity for their families so we don't we're not just dealing with people who are on the move we're dealing with people in refugee camps we're dealing with people at the point of conflict so in the communities that they um still reside in despite the fact that conflict whirls around them i was actually supposed to be in um in drc last week but because of the situation in goma and the m23 coming back into play um around the goma area i couldn't go there but there are women, mainly women and children in these camps, and they just move from camp to camp. They try to go back to their villages and then they're moving back into the camps again once the um, once the conflict comes towards them. So it's really a question of how do you protect this incredible group of people who are actually unlocking opportunity for their communities? Because they are very, very important to these communities. They are more likely to send their children to school. They are less likely to spend money in a way that isn't going to contribute to the community and to their children. And so we find that one of the ways of um, really doing our work well is by working predominantly with women and girls. 
one of the things that is different about Ukraine than any other war I've covered is that by and large, the refugees have been welcome mm. in neighboring countries. That is almost never the case. People put up barriers to keep refugees out of their country in most places. But when I was in Poland, uh, uh, the Polish people were incredibly welcoming. About a million and a half Ukrainians are now in Poland. Uh, and uh, a, a quick anecdote, if, if I may. Um, so these ladies have their children, right? And they're on the train and there's nowhere to sit. So they're standing on the train, holding their child for six or eight hours. They get off the train and what do they not have? They don't have a baby buggy. So the mayor of Prashimish notices this and he puts a call out to everyone in town, bring us your baby buggies. And by the time a couple of three hours passed, there was an enormous stack of strollers uh, waiting as these trains came in. Um, a very different circumstance than most refugees uh, face. There are a million and a half Ukrainians in uh, uh, Poland, uh, almost a million in Germany. They've been very welcoming, but I wonder to what degree you're concerned about refugee fatigue. How long will the welcome mat be out? So our um, head of the emergency response team, Bob Kitchen, who I know that you know, and I know that other people who are ISIS supporters will know, he's a phenomenal guy. He just came back um, last week. So it was just before Kherson was retaken um, and he was right up to that border. And his report out was pretty bleak. He thinks that externally, there is still a sense of we need to hold together and welcome these people into our homes and into our societies, but it's wearing thin because they know that this is for the long haul. So they're concerned about that. And um, these refugees have a two year staying visa in, in Europe. But again, you know, time is, is ticking on. So we're concerned about uh, how people are going to put down roots and whether they're going to be able to go back. And also the winter is looking like it's going to be really severe. It's already extremely cold. You're giving me the exact temperatures. So again, um, Scott knows exactly what's going on. The highs in Kiev today were in the 20s. There you go, see. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and so we're really worried about more people coming out. And then the overloading on some of these communities, particularly close to the border, it will wear thin. It is really hard. It's going to be. It's going to be really tough on them. And internally as well. Don't forget those internally displaced people are living with families and living in places outside of the um, uh, the the west um, the western area. And and that is wearing thin as well. It's it's a lot to put on these people. So we are concerned. Let's talk for a moment about uh, how IRC does what it does. What services it provides for refugees. I mean, imagine if you will, your family at your home, and something occurs and you lose your home, you lose your bank accounts, you have no access to that, maybe no vehicles, and now you're walking with your children down I-95 looking for a place to live, food to eat, water to drink. That is the situation that these millions of people that Madeline is talking about face in their lives. So Madeline, Map it out for me. There's a conflict in Region X. Suddenly, unexpectedly, thousands of people are being stampeded over the border by the conflict. What does IRC do? That's a great question. Um, many different things. So it was always one of the things that we struggled with when people say to you, what do the IRC, what does the IRC do? And we'd sit there and think, well, pretty much everything but food. And then we started doing food. So um, <laughs> that, that didn't work. I think the most important thing that we do is whether you're in a protracted crisis. So I just came back from um, Kenya, Kakuma camp, which I think you've been to, or Dadaab, you've certainly been to. Yes, in Kenya. Yeah. So that's that's a that's a place where many people came out of Sudan predominantly and ended up in a camp on the borders of Kenya. And they have been there since 1992. So generations of people have 
you know, been brought up completely, born and raised within that camp. So that's one type born of setting. Born and raised as a refugee. As a refugee. A person who has no country. And with no ability to earn money. So no ability to uh, get out there and put down roots and be part of the Kenyan community, because very deliberately, the Kenyan government put these refugee camps in very, very difficult places, um, which were a very long way from civilization. And so that's a protracted crisis place. So in those refugee camps, as they get set up, we are often partnering with UNHCR to set those camps up and start to create education environments, make sure that there is health and um, health services, making sure that we are looking after unaccompanied minors, all of those things that you can imagine, protection for women and girls, safe spaces for women and girls, you name it, that we're setting up that kind of infrastructure. But one of the really important things that I don't think is understood about that you're right, you know, you're walking up the I-95, you've had to run out of your house, you've literally taken a, a backpack with you. And we did a piece of work not that long ago about what do people pack in their bags mm. as they head into into head away from conflict. And there's always it's they have their phone and then they have pictures of their family. And mm -hmm. those are the absolute definites that you would grab because you can't replace them. There's something about that link back to your to your home. But the first thing you have to do is ask them what they need. And there's, I think that's the big shift in, in our sector and in the way that we respond to these conflicts, which is to try and make sure that we are not saying, hey, here's your tent and here's your blanket and here's your dignity kit. And, but to say, what do you want? And I think one of the really interesting things is, is that people coming in, to, as soon as they're in any kind of host community or camp, often it won't be health, it won't be food, it won't be shelter, it will be, where are my kids gonna get educated? which you don't really think about, but mm -hmm. that's such a priority. And I can imagine that as well. You know, if you're, if you're, you're suddenly ripped from your community, the future of your children is so tenuous. You just want to make sure that they're going to continue to be able to be educated. And, and so education in those crisis settings is something that we're also doing and paying a lot of attention to. I mean, imagine these people in the camp since 1992 that you were talking about. Imagine if there were no educational opportunities. You'd have an entire generation of people mm -hmm. who would be illiterate, uneducated, yeah. living uh, the only life they know yeah. would I, be the refugee camp. Absolutely. I had this really, I mean, it was a difficult trip because um, uh, my kids are here and I come back and complain about things. So um, they, they know that I was moaning about this when I when I got back. Not moaning, I was I had rage. Um, because one of the one of the difficult things is in these really protracted crises where you have refugee camps um, that have been going for a long time, and there's no real way that these people they can't go back to their communities. They are not going to head back into South Sudan right now. Why would they? They're not going to be heading back to Mali, Burundi, and and um, I was speaking to a group of incentive workers. So we have a mass of people that work for us from the refugee community because that does two things one is the very best providers of services are often the people that are from the refugee community themselves and the second is that you can give them a small stipend which helps them to um, support their families and I was sitting in a vaccination unit um, and uh, and I was asking people where they were from and there were like these five guys sitting around and one of them was from Somalia one of them was DRC, another one was, I mean, literally every country that we were working on in, in the region. And I pretty much visited all of these countries. And I was like, yeah, I was there then. And they went, oh, you shouldn't have been there. It's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but this real sort of sense of uh, such a dislocation from, from, their, from their countries. And no, you know, do you think you'll ever go back? They're just terrified. There's no way that they're going to cross that border and go back to these places. But the other thing that's really concerning is that um, that you think about what's happening in Ukraine and you just saw the video, which is very much about this is what's in the headlines. You can see what's in the headlines, but what's not in the headlines are things like what's happening in that camp. So because we are so stretched as um, as an international community now in terms of the humanitarian aid that we give, the WFP, the World Food Programme, has cut the rations in Kakuma. And this is at a time where there is massive drought, as everybody probably knows, in the Horn of Africa. So Kenya, Ethiopia and uh, Somalia. And that means that and in this camp, there are, there's nowhere for them to grow food. There is no they're not allowed to go out and get a job that would be illegal. And so they're stuck in this camp. So the only food that they're going to get is WFP given food. 
and they cut the they cut the rations. I then walk into this clinic, the pediatric clinic where these guys were working, and I looked at the. Um, they always show me the graphs of you know, how many malnutrition cases have have happened, and I was looking at this massive spike, and I was just like, "Why is there a massive spike at this time? Is that the drought?" And they were like, "No, that's because we cut the rations." So it's just that that's the protracted crisis side of things that's where and that's what's hidden and what we're not seeing and that's there are two million children who die of um malnutrition a year globally and that doesn't need to happen we know exactly what to do to stop these children dying there is no shortage of food it's getting the food to the right places that is so often the difficulty what world food program does uh, all around the world um David Beasley, the director of uh, WFP, uh, was telling me recently that um, because of the loss of grain from Ukraine, mm -hmm. they were, as he put it, trying to decide who would go hungry so that no one would starve. Completely. And that that was the situation that the World Food Program found itself in at, at this point in time. It's really tough. It's really tough because that everybody is stretched so thin and... And and the thing about Ukraine is it's a it's this horrific crisis in Europe, which is unimaginable. There is a war going on in Europe, and the the effects of, of that on on the people in the surrounding countries are absolutely dire. And and obviously we're there and we really feel for them. The but the knock on effects that we are feeling with supply chain, with um you know not being able to find the things that we normally want in on supermarket shelves, the fact that nobody can get the car that they want right now, the fact that fuel prices are going up, all of that is really affecting the Horn of Africa because the grain prices they're very very dependent on grain, they can't afford it. Fuel prices have gone up. The fuel prices exacerbate the grain prices. And the other thing is that Ukraine is also one of the biggest providers of fertilizer. And so all of those three things have gone massively hiked. And so they've got climate. So they've got the drought. So they've got, I think we're into the sixth rainy season that hasn't happened in Somalia right now, which means that famine will is almost like certainly going to be called imminently. But by the time famine has called is has been called, you've always already got hundreds of thousands of people who've died of starvation. Um, and they've got that, they've got climate, they've got conflict, and now they've got this knock-on effect from Ukraine and they've just come out of COVID. So all of those things roiled together creates this huge emergency in the Horn of Africa. An enormous part of what IRC does is that if a refugee situation becomes intractable and those people are going to be in those camps for years, as you mentioned, can't go back to the place they came from. IRC helps resettle refugees, particularly here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Tell us how that works. So it's a it's an incredible i mean this this country is an incredible country in terms of its history of of uh, refugee resettlement into the united states it's a far more generous and open country than many across the world so i want to start by saying that because it's been for me as a as a brit coming in um and and seeing the kind of numbers of people and the process whereby people are resettled is is really heartwarming it hasn't been so great recently um, the we've obviously had this massive influx of Afghanistan Af Afghan people into into the United States, which has been forty five thousand, I think, have been resettled. So what normally happens is that if you are in a protracted crisis setting, usually in the refugee camp, you absolutely know that you are not going to be able to to go back. You are allowed to basically seek refugee status in countries where there are refugee al uh, numbers allocated, and so. Uh, the current allocation for refugees in the United States is uh, 120,000. Um, but sadly, this year, if you take the Afghanistan people out, we basically got 25,000 people resettled into the United States. The U.S. government puts a cap yeah. on the number of refugees that the country yeah. is willing to accept at any given time. Yes. Depending on the administration, the cap can grow or become smaller. Absolutely. So it's an executive decision whether what that what that cap is going to be, and it's negotiated each year. So it went down, obviously, significantly during the previous administration. Um, I think during the Obama administration, it was at a high of 125,000. And that um, President Biden has taken that back up again. The difficulty of actually getting 
people through the process and into the country and getting the mechanisms back up and running has been very, very difficult. So that's still not really getting the pace that we'd hope to, to get. But it's it's an incredible thing. I mean, we have 26 offices across the United States and we have people pitching up at airports to collect these designated refugees from various different places around the world. They get off those planes and they they literally have nothing. They have these plastic bags, these um, uh, UNHCR plastic bags full of full of their belongings. And we pick them up and we take them to their new apartment. We'll have put their kids bedding together. And we have a lot of this is done through volunteers as well. Um, an apartment and an, that you found for yes, them. Yes, we have to find their an apartment. An apartment that you furnished for them. You created a home for them mm -hmm. before they ever arrived. Yes. So um, it's a, and it's a, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to do for these people. But then the important thing is how do you get them really putting down roots and being part of a community? And the very first thing is they need to be able to speak the language and they need to be able to get a job. And so those things are the first things that we do with refugees in, in the United States, which is. And those 26 U.S. offices, mm -hmm. in my experience, have relationships with employers in those cities mm -hmm. and facilitate these people getting training and getting jobs. Yeah. You do everything that you can to make them an American dream success story. Absolutely. And hopefully over time, get them through the legal processes that they need to go through to become an American citizen. So those legal services are also provided. You have a caseworker who is working on getting their kids into the right school, making sure that their health issues are dealt with. So it's a real wraparound um, program that we we give them. So the government pays for three months and we try to extend that through our support to six months support. One of the largest and most well-developed uh, IRC refugee camps in the world is in Thailand on the border with Myanmar because the crisis in Myanmar has been going on for so very long. And uh, I was there uh, watching a group who were about to be sent to the United States. They had all been uh, accepted into the United States and IRC was training them in a classroom to be Americans. And they had they had a picture of Barack Obama in those days up up on the on the wall and they were explaining who he was and what he did for a living. And uh, and then uh, there there were uh, pictures of pizza on the wall and they were explaining what that was all about. And the lesson that they were giving them uh, when I was there at that moment was 911. That if you're in trouble, you need a doctor, you need a policeman or something, you dial these numbers and someone will answer. They, there were a lot of questions about that and, and what 911 would do and not do. And, and, but they found it fascinating. They haven't got great experiences yeah. <laughs> of the police either. So. <laughs> but that is true. In that that is very true. So this is what IRC was doing in Thailand with these people. An IRC office in the United States had already arranged an apartment and furniture and clothes, and they knew where the kids were going to go to school and maybe even had a job lined up before these people in Thailand ever got on a plane. A lot of people I met in Thailand were very much like uh, the people that you were describing. They had, oh, I'm sorry, your phone is giving me fits. Um, they, there are people who were born in the refugee camp, mm -hmm. uh, grownups who were oh. born in the refugee camp and had never- Grandmothers who have never seen, have never been anywhere other than the refugee camp. Never, never been anywhere else. And the ties, did not allow anyone to leave the refugee camp. So you're, you've literally spent your whole life in the confines cities. of this They're refugee They're basically camp. cities. And ima imagine if the International Rescue Committee was not there operating this camp and giving you what is essentially the only way out to have, to have a life. Uh, you have been very recently on the southern border of Texas, and Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, major refugee crisis happening with Venezuelans right now. Tell us what you saw and tell us what the need is there. Yeah, so I, um, 
I think it was two weeks ago, I uh, I crossed the border from El Paso across to Juarez. And so I went um, and visited the detention centers in El Paso, uh, crossed over the border, and then was meeting some of the people who had been pushed back over the border and really didn't know what they were going to be doing next. And so I think the thing that that is concerning for us is that the the conditions of people as they come across the river, as they're, as they're coming across the border, they're being kept in, in very difficult circumstances for supposedly only 24 hours, but it's actually often longer than that before they can process them and decide whether they're going to be an asylum case in the detention centers or whether they're going to just go straight on the southbound bridge back into Juarez. Um, so the, the detention center was hard to see i mean it's been there for in, since 1966 a lot of those detention centers um and uh, they color code the inmates um according to whether they think they have got if they've got a criminal record but that could be petty theft they're in a red jumpsuit mm -hmm. if they have come over the border tw more than once they're in an orange jumpsuit and if they appear to have no previous record and haven't cr tried to cross the border and they're in blue jumpsuits so it feels very much like a, a prison and um, with quite difficult, uh, understandably difficult, it's very difficult for, for them and it's very difficult for the country to, to, to be processing this number of people. And then I sat in a, um, in a courtroom. So they have these small courtrooms in the actual detention centers where the individuals who are looking for asylum. So the people in the detention centers usually have a, some kind of asylum claim um, and then they're taken into the courtrooms. And because of COVID, the judge wasn't in the courtroom. The judge was in an adjacent courtroom. So there was this individual, this young girl sitting sitting at the table and the judge was being beamed in. Uh, and these disembodied voices were translating for her. Mm. And she was, her language was a, one of the Mayan indigenous languages. So she didn't speak Spanish. She spoke something that you know, had to be translated. So the judge would say something. And then there would be translation into Spanish. And then she'd hear this other disembodied voice speaking in this indigenous language. I have no idea what the quality of the translation was. I got lost halfway through the Spanish. Um, and she, and the judge was rightly taking her through all the steps of this is what you need to do in order to, you know, to seek asylum, da -da, you know, all of these different things. And she was sitting there with no notebook. I don't know if she was literate and, um, and after that, she would then have to go back, having been given all of this information, and then she would have to fill in a form in English. So it's, it was just hard to, to see how many people could be successful in that situation. The, 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 what's peculiar and, and hard to, to understand is also as you cross the border, you can look down over the bridge. I did it on foot. And you're literally watching these people going under the bridge over, over the river and heading straight into border patrol and the border patrol and picking them up and taking them off. And so it's just a, you know, it's just constant. So we know, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people are crossing, trying to cross the border every day. The, our concern is that, you know, obviously we want conditions to improve on this side of the border whilst people are being processed and, and, and rightly so the conditions on the other side of the border are very, very concerning to us. So as these, as these families and individuals get taken back across to Juarez, they are entirely uh, vulnerable. So women are being trafficked, children are being kidnapped, they're being he they're heading off into other parts of South America and being sold. It's really, really concerning. They know the areas where they'll get picked up if they're there at the wrong time. So that worries us, obviously. So we're doing a lot of shelter work on 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 the Mexican side of the border, just to try and give people time uh, to recalibrate and to rethink what they're going to do next. Um, and there's some amazing people in those communities who've opened up their homes and created these safe spaces for people on the move and these people who are who are migrants. But I don't know if people have seen um, uh, some of the, the photographs and the perilous journey that people are taking through the Darien Gap as they're heading away from Venezuela. Um, and it, that is like you're heading into jungle, you're heading into where there are ferocious animals, poisonous snakes, m swamps, muddy hills, um, and traffickers who are ready to either kill you or, or, or sell you. 
and it will take you like five days to cross the Darien Gap. And I was in a shelter. Um, sorry to go on. This is recent. You're and supposed to be. recent, <laughs> recent, and um, and and a tough one. And in the basement of one a pastor that we support um, the the um, uh, this the shelter in Juarez um, had set up in the basement. I met this woman, and she had a beautiful three month old baby and four other children. And she had fled. Uh, the her home because her husband um had been threatened and they had to flee for their lives actually from ecuador they were from venezuela they'd moved through ecuador and she did the darien gap without her husband who had had to flee first with all of those children five days after giving birth so that baby that i held the three month old she then managed to get across the border and been pushed straight back uh, across the, but she'd been in in such cold conditions because once that I was I was completely confused. I'm British. I went to El Paso. I thought it was going to be warm. It was not warm. <laughs> and um, but it was the the baby had pneumonia and just the the just the concept of how desperate that woman had to have been to stand with these five children. One of them, a baby in arms, having just given birth and saying, "Right, I'm going to head into that jungle," is it's not somebody who's just looking for a slightly better life. These are desperate people. So we have to think about how we, um, there's two things. We have to think about whether there are other ways, protection um, pathways for them, but also how we give them good advice as they are moving uh, on the, these migration routes that, that they're moving on. And, and that's, the, it's a, that's the second. And then the third is the root causes. Where are they coming from? Why are they coming from these countries? Why are they fleeing these countries? And can we support um, them in their countries to stay or find places for them that are going to be good resettlement opportunities for them that aren't in the U.S.? Um, so, What is IRC doing to mitigate this problem on the southern border? Well, we're, we're trying to make sure that, we, that, that, that people are getting good legal advice. So uh, there are a number of centers that we set up where people who are seeking asylum can get the kind of legal representation and help and translation and support to go through the process. Uh, so that's that's one thing that we're doing. Uh, we're also doing something called Signpost. So Signpost is a really great, uh, a fantastic um, uh, program that we set up, which is really getting all of the information that a refugee or somebody who's displaced needs at the point that they would normally get information in their language um, at the moment that they head out or arrive in a, in another country. And so what we're also trying to do is make sure that as they move through Latin America, they are getting good advice about where to go, where not to go, what's, what's likely going to happen to you at the, at the Mexican U S border. Um, and where can you find support and where might you be able to find shelter and is there health care that you can get on the way? Um, are there other opportunities for you or other possibilities for you? So that, that, that kind of information provision is very, very important and, and allows us also to give protection advice and, and to understand where the flows of refugees are as well. This humanitarian work that IRC does uh, is too frequently quite dangerous for the people who work for you and volunteer for you. Mm. Yeah, more so. We were talking about, you You were remember, You were recalling, I think it was 12 years ago that we lost um, some staff in, really sadly in Afghanistan. And that used to be, um, you know, a really horrendous thing where we would lose staff who were working for us. Uh, it's a very common occurrence now. And I think it's the, just the, the nature when you travel as a humanitarian and when you work as a humanitarian, the very best thing is to not be hanging out with people with guns. If you're, if you're being, if you have security around you with guns, you're much more likely to get shot. Humanitarians go in, you always see them in their big white freelanders with their flags. And that the reason for that is because people really understand that you're there to help and support. And therefore they don't want to um, pull you into their conflict but that's happening. That safety of around humanitarian workers is diminishing, um, and the um, the regularity with which we have people kidnapped or hurt is is becoming increasing increasingly worrying. Astounding bravery! It is incredible. on the part of these people who They're want amazing. nothing more than to help their fellow man. Absolutely amazing, and they get straight back to it. I mean, they literally they get taken. 
Uh, I've got four people at the moment in in who've been kidnapped in Mali. I know we'll get them out. This it's this very strange thing where you have very you have to have very good communication with the local community. So we know where they are. They know that they'll be let out hopefully in the next couple of days, um, and they'll be back at work within seven days. What you were mentioning to me before, when when I was uh, working with IRC, we had uh, people killed in Afghanistan in an ambush. Um, the driver of that vehicle was the only survivor, but he was gravely wounded. And you were telling me earlier that I know. he's still with us. He's still working for the IRC after that experience. Yeah, there's a there's a I was in I went to uh, Afghanistan in March this year. And uh, there's a road from Kabul to Logar province that's called the road of death because it used to get so many attacks on the cars that nobody ever drove it. They would only ever be able to go by flights and helicopters. So Logar was a a really incredibly impoverished, really tough place to, to live. And that was the road that our staff were attacked on. So I drove that road with 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 him. It was uh, incredible. I mean, think about that. This is where he was. He was like, yeah, this is where I got blown up. I was like, that's making me feel quite uncomfortable in so many ways. But um, it, it's just, and he's, it, people are so passionate about their country, their people, and engaging with us. I mean, 95% of our staff are from the countries. Uh, they're not, you know, people in khakis and running around uh, uh, um, saving the world. They're saving their own communities. They're working in their own communities. And he's a particularly incredible individual. Such an important point, working with the local people wherever you work. You're not dropping a, a, a bus full of Americans into a place and, let, and having them say, okay, you're, here's how we're going to do things. You uh, maybe bring in a an expert or two, and then hire the local staff, the people who know the people there. Completely. And I think, so there's a, there's a good reason why we, I was talking to somebody today about what, what makes IRC different to other NGOs. And I think the thing that is different about us is that we are working in 43 countries, not 143 countries. And so we have very strict entry and exit criteria. So we go in when there aren't other NGOs, there isn't a government, there isn't civil society that can support the people and that we go through very, very strict. Is there another way that this could get done? Because if there is, it will be more sustainable probably than us going in, number one. Number two, when we do go in, then we want to make sure that we're really drawing from local partners, that we're really bringing in uh, local people to, to be working for us. And the talent is immeasurably huge in these countries. Um, so we yeah predominantly we're working with people who are from the communities know the communities I talked about that the four people in Mali the reason I know that the four people in where exactly where the four people in Mali are is because they are from the communities and the community is telling us exactly what's happening so that that sort of is such a symbiotic relationship and and so important for us and also what makes it so great to work for this organization I neglected to mention that we are going to need some intelligent questions for <laughs> Madeline. So uh, we are, we're going to open up the room to questions here in just a moment. So think about that and think about what you would like to know. Difficult. Uh, but um, Madeline, I, I have a, a forward looking question. You're the chief operating officer. So you have to look over the horizon at what's coming next. And I wonder virtually everything you do involves conflict. To what degree are you concerned about a world in which we have climate refugees? Yeah, I mean, that's the that's the best question. Um, we are extremely concerned because the the fragile context that we work in are the most impacted by climate change. So as I talked about, the Horn of Africa right now um, is in such a terrible state, but they are not big users of energy. They did not cause climate change, but climate change is happening to them. So the whole COP debate um, over the last couple of weeks has been exactly that, which is they are living the consequences of climate change. And so we think that there's going to be probably by 2050, uh, I think 200 million people are going to be displaced from their homes due to climate change. 
200 million people more re refugees to climate than we have today from war. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the work that, well, we need to get ahead of that for a start. So uh, we've got to we've got to do all of the things in in the toolkit of adaptation, resilience, uh, making sure that we're we're ready for these movements, which we know will happen. I think that's one of the frustrating things about uh, seeing what happened in the Horn of Africa, which is we we get good at things and then we we let them go. So. When I say we, I mean the international community. I'm not, I'm sorry, they get good at things and then they let them go. Um, and one of the things that was really frustrating to see that is in 2016, there was a major drought and we, I think 200,000 people lost, lost their lives in the Somali region. And then four years later, they had set up really good early warning systems. So they knew exactly what to look for so that they could see that the, the, the famine situation that was going to build back was happening. And then they put lots of things in place and very few people lost their lives because we were ready. We knew what we were doing. We could get the food programs ready. We stopped people from getting on the move so fast. And so that all worked. This time around, because there was real distraction, no early warning system. The early warning system was there, but nobody was paying attention to it because people were looking at all of these different things elsewhere in the world. And so I think there's something around, we've really got to be thinking, we know these things are going to happen. We know exactly where they're going to happen. And we have to ready ourselves for them happening because the not readying ourselves for them happening will be hundreds of thousands of people, which will be happening now, are losing their lives. And this is why I said at the out outset that you don't want to live in a world without the International Rescue Committee. Let's take some questions from the audience. Um, the lights up here are quite blinding, so I can't see any of you. But um, but I might be able to make out. We have we we have uh, these lovely people with microphones. So if you have a question, put your hand up, and we will get a microphone to you. Or I can interview you, Scott, maybe. <laughs> there we are. Yes, please. How you're funded and what the economics of all this is are. I told please. you we needed intelligent questions. <laughs> so um, when, um, when I joined the IRC uh, in 2014, we were... 90% funded by governments. So most of our money was, um, or most of our resources were coming from USAID, which is a, a really big donor to us, um, and European governments that would be asking us to do specific work in specific countries on specific things. So we're a delivery agency predominantly. And that was one of the, which is, fantastic we do a very good job we got a reputation for doing our job extremely well uh, and delivering extremely effectively what we needed to do was change that that was 90 percent government and then 10 percent what we call private private funding and the that mix wasn't wasn't the right mix for any organization because if you're going to innovate and, and one of the things that is so important in this sector is if you think about what I've been describing in terms of the massive growth of need uh, and the resources are diminishing, not growing, that means that you have to be so much more effective. You have to innovate. You have to be thinking, how do you solve this problem differently? How do you do this in a more effective way? And so being a really performance-driven organization has been the big push for us over the last nine years and getting a very different mix of income and so we uh, nine years ago we were we were 90 10 we're now i think 70 30 um we should we want to be a 50 50 mix because that really gives you the flexibility to do the work that you know is going to work best because sometimes it can be very very frustrating because your what um government donors want you to do you have so much experience on the ground you're like i don't think we should really be doing that we should be doing this and they can't necessarily be persuaded but if you have um your own private fundraising um resources then then you can you can do things differently and i think that's uh that's so the mix that we want to to get to so 
in 2014, we were a $450 million organization. This last year, we raised over $500 million of private fundraising. So that's been the big shift for the IRC. And it's been incredible that we've had that um, that that shift has made us able to do some really interesting work, particularly in the innovation space. We, I was talking about malnutrition. Uh, this, I'm going. You absolutely asked the the question that's got me into. Um, it's a really good question. Uh, but there there are certain things that are happening in this world that do not need to happen. They just don't. And that those two million children that I was talking about earlier that 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 die of uh, of malnutrition each year. There are two ways that you can treat them. There, there are those who are acutely malnourished and there's those who are, have chronic malnourishment. And for some reason, you have one UN agency that is responsible for acute and one UN agency that is responsible for chronic. And they have these things called RUTF, which is plumpy nut. You'll see them in silver packages that you'll have seen them all over the world that are given. And one is red and the other one is orange. And one agency gives them this red one, which is a thousand calories. And the other one gives them this orange one, which is 500 calories. And we have this incredible team that, that started asking the questions, you know, if you give somebody who's been malnourished for a lot lengthy period of time, rather than the acute malnourishment, the other one, will they explode? And it's like, <laughs> no. So why are we doing this separately? And why can't we have one protocol for treating these children and one clinic that people can go to so that parents understand where they need to go to? Or, hey, let's not have clinics. Let's really get out to the communities and make sure that we are able to give these um, children the nourishment that they need. And we have an evidence base now. We just did a, a piece of research in Mali which showed that if we put this malnutrition protocol together and we did malnutrition in the same way, um, 80% more children's lives were saved by doing it. So I think that's the, the answer to your question is that's where we get our money. But the, the incredible opportunity is when you can get brilliant people solving problems and doing things differently. And that's, that's what we're able to do when we have our own flexibility. Uh, to Madeline's point, a, lo a lot of the government money from the United States and from other governments is very tightly defined. Uh, for example, you can spend this money on uh, gender issues in this camp in Kenya. Uh, and so that's, hands are tied. That's where that money's going. But then Russia invades Ukraine. Well, nobody wrote a grant proposal for Ukraine a year ago. So IRC has to have the flexibility, has to have the money to be able to respond to that emergency that no one saw coming. And so um, such an important point that uh, the, the government funds are absolutely vital, but there are strings attached always, and it is the other money, the private donations that are raised that allow the IRC to have the flexibility for innovation, as you were just talking about, and the flexibility to respond to that thing that nobody saw coming. Yeah, Another the outpouring of support, by the way, um, for Ukraine from, from people in the US was phenomenal. And so we were able to hit the ground seriously running and be able to build up programs very, very quickly. And you're absolutely right. It's probably only over the last two months that we've started to see government grants come through because that's how long it takes mm. to get them up and running. So yeah, it enables us to do emergency response. Another question, please. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, first, what you're doing is extraordinary, so thank you for doing it. Yeah, there was no pause to say that before starting asking questions. Um, I wonder, is, is there ever a year where you have seen refugees, refugee numbers dwindle? Is it always simply up, up, up? I'm afraid it's always simply up, up, up. And I see no sign of it going down, particularly as Scott rightly pointed out, that climate change is going to cause so many more people to be on the move um, in the very near future. We can already see it happening. So it's a, it's a really horrible business to be in when you say this is a growth business, but it is a growth business. And we've got to find lots of new ways of thinking about this in order to be able to cover the expansive need that is out there. So... The third most spoken language in Texas is Vietnamese. 
Yeah. Another question. Um, you talked about the work that you do in the camps, and I'm wondering, is it transitional housing or permanent housing, or do you even provide housing, or are you just providing skills and nutrition and sort of insights for people? I'm not getting a, a sense of what you provide in terms of the longevity of it. So every, in these, camp, in these protracted crisis camps where people they've got no they've got nowhere to go sometimes these camps open up and then they hopefully will close down as people either go back to their homes as the conflict settles or they actually get integrated into new countries so i would hope that at some point the camps that we we do a lot of work obviously in jordan where the syrian refugees have come over so zartri camp is a massive camp about an hour outside of um the the capital city and but, you know, they open up and you hope that they're going to close down soon. But that one's been going now for 10 years. And they so just a sense of these are cities, really. But they're cities that are not cities that you want to live in. And the Kakuma, just to, to give you a sense of what it looks like, it just depends where you are. When they first set up, it'll be tense. And then as time goes on, they'll be given building materials to, to create their own accommodations, which so in Kakuma broadly, they're given um they're given the materials to make their mud block homes. And so they make mud bricks and they create these uh these mud houses with corrugated iron roofs. And the temperatures up there are phenomenally high. So it's effectively, if you think about it, it's like having a clay oven. Because you've got the you've got the mud walls and then but then you have the non traditional roofing so they're extremely extremely hot um, and so it it just depends where you are but they're not they're not um, the the refugee camps are like a patchwork of of people that that support them so UNHCR the UN agency that looks after refugees are the the overarching sort of leaders of these camps and people who work through who's going to do what and then different NGOs are given different responsibilities so we may in one camp be running the health clinics which we were in Kakuma um, in other camps we may be specifically working on educational safe spaces for women it really depends what your expertise in the area is and what UNHCR wants you to do and then there's the additional stuff that we would we do when we see a gap um, and where we are able to fund something that isn't government related does that I hope that answers your question who do we have next Uh, thank you for this uh, much needed presentation uh, on uh, what occasion or what drives a collaboration with different NGOs. We it, with local NGOs or just. Yeah, we look, we it's, it's a really interesting thing, you know, you you're in business and you absolutely you, you talk about your competitors. We don't we talk about our sister agencies. Mm -hmm because we are effect, we are constantly working with each other and really trying to work out where in one location they may have strength that we don't have and then you end up in you're working in coalition so there's multiple ways i could answer that question one is it's very very important to have clusters of skills and intelligence and understanding in any kind of crisis setting so you've got to be coordinated it's that's really really important so so we are part of these coalition discussions and cluster groups where we sit down and we work through who should be doing what and where and the impact of somebody taking a health clinic out of one place is going to have an impact on work elsewhere if you're in the health cluster and so that coordination is really critical and you'll hear the language of the the clusters wherever you go in crisis settings um we've also do a lot of work as um ingos and ngos with local partners on influence on trying to really take all of our learnings and the understanding that we have of the context where we're working and bring that back to some of these governments to say you know what if you did this differently we think we could reach many more people or are you aware that you're predominantly doing health in this this place but really we should be thinking about education or 
you know, you really have to push for access to some populations, particularly concerned at the moment in northeast Nigeria, that there's about a million people that we ha- nobody has got to for a very long period of time. So starting the actual um, diplomatic pressure on the Nigerian government to allow access corridors in. So that's all a really important part of how we coordinate and how we um, pull pull information back into uh, into where it counts. So. And one of the beautiful things about that coordination is it, it almost eliminates duplication of effort. Mm. Uh, you 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 sort out in the beginning. This organization is going to take care of water and sanitation. This organization is going to take sh- care of shelter, et cetera. I'm oversimplifying it, but you get the idea. As Madeline was saying, different organizations have different strengths, and when they go into a massive refugee problem. Uh, they rely on those strengths, coordinate, and so that they're not spending too much money on this and not enough on that. Although the downside, there isn't, or the, the, the sad thing that does happen sometimes, and I've seen more recently than I have before, is I went to Somalia in June and uh, flew quite far into the country into a place called Guy Col. And the further out I got, the more I was seeing facilities with NGO names on them that were health facilities that were empty because the funding had been cut off or the danger in that particular area had become too great and the risks were too high. And so there's also there are these moments where that the the cluster doesn't work because the cluster hasn't got the resources to actually continue to do the work. And Mm -hmm. so that I think that's a that's a tough thing to see, you know, when the you see the wash signs up, but the borehole's not working. And um, sometimes you just can't stay because you don't have the resources to continue to do the work. So I think we'll have time for one more question. All right. Um, When you were talking about the climate challenges, of course, one question at least comes to mind is to the extent to which the original definition of refugee will be re-paradigm, shall we say. And I'm curious to know what IRC and other INGOs, even NGOs, are doing to work with the UN to consider that. Hmm. That is a brilliant question to end on. Um, it's, you know, the, the, the UN Charter was written a very long time ago in a very, very different world. And the um, it was the way that it described the kind of need that you needed to have in order to be a refugee, I don't think really translates in the same way and needs to change significantly. We push daily, day in, day out. We are pushing for real meaningful changes to, to the designation of refugee. And the concept of being a climate refugee is a really important part of that. Um, there's also, you know, people who... The, the the long-term displacement sometimes in countries as well is something that we're concerned about um climate refugees there's also something around whether you can be an economic refugee as well which is something that that is debated and has been thought through as well like i described that that lady with five children who headed through the darien gap would be called an economic migrant and whether you know the 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 seriousness of her situation and how she's moving away from what is a crisis which is an economic crisis is also something that can be designated so there's it's a big debate it's it's out there the un does not move quickly it's and Mm -hmm. it's and when you've got a un security council um with the current membership it makes it even more difficult to to make the kind of changes that you need to make if you Interested in knowing more, one of the best sources of information on refugee crises all around the world is the IRC website. They break it down by region of the world. It has very updated information. It's absolutely brilliant. Madeline, thank you for working on behalf of the world's most vulnerable people. Madeline Sadler, everyone. Stop. <laughs>
Thanks, Beth. I just want to say a quick thank you to both of you for coming this evening. Needless to say, I think this conversation will go on and on, I hope, with all of you and with the two of you. And I want to thank Rob Marks for making all this happen. And on behalf of the Board of Trustees, come back soon. We love having you all here. So thank you guys so much for coming. Thank, thank you. you.